Do you want to know all about the diagnostic test that you can use in veterinary dermatology to help you make a diagnosis? Well, stay on this video and by the end you should know 10 tests that can really help you in making a diagnosis. For the best veterinary tips, please subscribe to the channel and if you click on the bell, we will send you notifications every time we publish a new video. I want to talk to you today about the various diagnostic tests that you can do in dermatology after you've taken a good physical uh, examination and a good history, of course. We're going to begin with coat brushings. It's amazing how often a simple problem like a flea problem can be missed. So one of the most important tools for a, a vet or a nurse is a flea comb. Obviously, if you take the cat or the dog and you comb and comb and then put that on a white piece of paper, it can be very easy then to see flea dirt, fleas themselves. And if you're very lucky and perhaps you use a darker piece of paper, you may even see flea eggs as well. It doesn't rule out fleas if you don't see those because we know that flea allergic cats, for example, can be very good at removing fleas and evidence of fleas from their coat by licking. But coat brushings are a very easy and important first test that you should do if you suspect any form of ectoparasite infestation. Number two is a hair plucking. Obviously either with tweezers or even just with your hand, you can actually pluck some hairs from the dog or the cat and then look at them under low power microscopy for evidence of, for example, the, the bottom of the hair, you can check for the presence of demodex mites. You can also check what stage the hair cycle is in by looking at the bulb of the hair shaft. But you can also check for things like dermatophytes for ringworm, abnormalities of the hair shaft that may suggest a hair follicle dysplasia or a colour mutant alopecia and it also will give you evidence of whether the hair has fallen out or has evidence of self-trauma so if you see lots of hairs that look broken that may be a sign of for example the cat licking and removing some of those hairs or nibbling at those hairs. Of course the first two tests are really just looking at the hair itself and isn't looking at the, the skin and going into the depths of the skin. So it can be useful uh, to scrape baldy areas or to actually use your clippers to remove some hair and then to actually scrape on the surface of the skin. This usually we use liquid paraffin with as well and it's important that we scrape at different depths. Often the demodex mite is a mite that lives in the follicle and so we need to scrape there until we see some capillary ooze, some blood coming out. If we don't, if we're not bold with our scrapings, uh, we can definitely miss demodex mites. We can also scrape on particular lesions, particularly with scabies, it's sometimes interesting to look for scale around the ear tips or for lesions around the elbows, the pressure points where we see a papule, maybe with a little crust on it. This can be the melting pocket of the scabies mite and can make it uh, much easier to find what is a difficult mite to find. So looking for a lesion that hasn't already been scraped and disturbed by the dog uh, will give you a better chance of finding the scabies mite. Uh, of course, another test that we use commonly in uh, dermatology is cytology. And to do cytology well, you do need a really good microscope. It is well worth spending the money on a microscope that has a really good quality times 100 oil immersion lens because this will allow you to see the bacteria and fungus that uh, you can commonly see in dermatology. So with cytology, you could, for example, if you see a pustule, you could remove the top of the pustule with a needle and then smear the material from the, the inside of the pustule onto your uh, slide, make sure that you just spread it slightly, and then you can stain that with dip quick, and then you will probably see white blood cells of some description, be they neutrophils, or possibly rare, more rarely eosinophils, and you can also check for bacteria within those blood cells as well, particularly the, the neutrophil. So that will give you an idea, is this a sterile problem? 
is it an, an infected problem? But of course, you can also do cytology on lumps by actually in, uh, pulling cells out of the lump or any sort of abrasion that you think looks uh, suspicious. It is possible to also uh, do an impression smear on that uh, lesion, stain it with Dipquick and again look for cells. And I would commonly use that also in epitheliotropic lymphoma and would sometimes see lymphocyte cells on that slide that made me uh, more suspicious of diseases like epitheliotropic lymphoma. So cytology, really useful. Uh, the only way you'll do it effectively is with a really good microscope. Culture and sensitivity is becoming more important now because of the rise of resistant strains of bacteria, particularly in the dermatology field, staph pseudintermediates. I, I think it's really important, particularly if there's been an antibiotic failure that you do take a sample, but certainly in second opinion cases now and in referral cases, it's much better practice to take a sample from a pustule, wait for the results two days later, and then start an appropriate antibiotic. And using antibiotics in a sensible stewardship fashion, we're not going to use rare antibiotics that should be saved for more life threatening conditions, perhaps in humans. But let's look and see that the uh, bacteria that we have there is sensitive to the common antibiotics that we may use in, in staph pyodermis, such as cephalosporins, potentiated amoxicillin, and so on, before we start that treatment. And of course, if we do see resistance, then it's much more likely that we'd be thinking of using shampoos rather than antibiotics per se to sort the problem out. So culture and sensitivity becoming increasingly important in the days of more resistant uh, bacteria. Fungal culture is of course very important, particularly in cats where there can be outbreaks which can be devastating from, a, um, from an economic perspective for breeders if they get microsporin canis or, or ringworm in their cats. And the most definitive diagnosis at the end, you may have used your woods lamp, you may think it's ringworm, but it is still worth sending a sample off. And it is very accurate if you allow the woods lamp to warm up before you use it. But it only causes fluorescence on microsporum canis. Other uh, dermatophytes, such as trichophyton, uh, will not fluoresce. And in those cases, you, of course, need to take samples from the area that you think potentially could be a ringworm problem and send those off to the laboratory. You can use in-house tests, uh, but you need to watch these very, very carefully. And if you're not <clears throat> an expert in mycology, it may well be worth just sending them to a lab to get a definitive diagnosis. Of course, if you've done all of those fairly surface tests and you're still scratching your head as to what the diagnosis could be, then a biopsy is a very sensible next step. It's important that you give the pathologist the most chance of success by sending several samples, maybe of different stages of the disease that you can see. And I think there are a few things to remember. If you look at a, a dog or a cat, but particularly a dog, and it has a lot of pyoderma on its skin, Inevitably, if you take a biopsy at that time, the pathologist may come back and says, this dog has a pyoderma, and it's more difficult to see the more subtle changes. So I would encourage you, if there is an obvious pyoderma, in most cases, I would encourage you to treat with antibiotics for at least three weeks before you take the biopsy. Of course, many of the cases that I saw in my dermatology clinic were allergic cases, and the majority were dogs rather than cats. In those cases, allergy testing uh, can be important, but it should be done not so much as a diagnostic test, although sometimes it can be used for that, but more so because you've ruled everything else out. You think this dog has atopic dermatitis, and the test is then done to help you to decide what the dog or the cat is allergic to with a view to creating a vaccine. There is some diagnostic value in it. If you do a blood test or a skin test and you find out that the dog is allergic to grasses, you know then that it has the kind of atopic dermatitis, a sort of hay fever, pollen allergy. There may be the opportunity to avoid some of those pollens if you know the fields that you're walking in are full of oak 
and your dog is allergic to oak, maybe you avoid that field. The ninth tip is uh, to use blood tests. And there are, of course, many blood tests that we can use to help us with skin diseases, depending on what we think the disease is. It's important before we jump into tests that we do have a definitive or, or a differential diagnosis list. And then we can do the relevant tests, be they skin scrapes or biopsies or blood tests having thought about what the potential diseases are. So for example, if we think that the dog may have scabies and we can't find scabies mites, there is a blood test developed by vets in Sweden that allows you to look for the antibodies of the scabies mites. And provided the infection has been going on or the infestation has been going on for long enough, that may well show an antibody to the scabies mite, which obviously allows you to make a diagnosis. So the last tip, we may have to use some dynamic testing, such as ACTH stimulation tests or low-dose dexamethasone suppression tests to actually help us make a diagnosis of Cushing's disease or using um, some of the uh, blood tests that are available for TSH assays and thyroid panels to help us make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So some of the more dynamic tests can be used uh, to help us with some of the hormonal diseases that we can see often in the older animals. So again, you are doing that test because you are suspicious rather than you are doing all of these tests as a blanket, hoping that you will find something that's positive. It's important that we have that differential list and we go off the back of that. So there's the 10 tips. I hope they've been helpful. If you've enjoyed the video, please do click on the like button. Do leave a comment if there's something that you want me to uh, reply back to, I'm happy to do that. If you want to receive more videos, click on the bell and we will send you notifications as we produce more videos. If you've enjoyed this video and you want to see more material from the webinar vet, then I would advise you to go over to thewebinarvet.com where you can see thousands of hours that we've done on the site uh, covering all sorts of topics from large, small animal practice management. Uh, so do go over there and look at it. And obviously also um, feel free to look at Wikivet, which is a site used by vets and vet students to help them with their studies. So uh, do go over and have a look at those two sites. Bye-bye.